Good afternoon. It's Victoria Beal with the Ohio LTAP Center, and we are so pleased to be able to provide for you this afternoon part four of our Work Zone Traffic Control and Safety course. We have done this as a series of webinars, starting with um, a webinar, I believe a week, a little over a week ago, um, where Ray Brushart, who is our instructor for this course, um, began at the beginning of our normal day-long course and has provided you the information that you would have received had you been able to attend in person. However, right now, due to our stay-at-home order and our social distancing policies, we are providing this course to you via webinar, and we're glad you're able to be on here. We have for you a couple housekeeping items, and then I'm going to turn things over to Ray. First off, in the handout section of your GoToWebinar panel, you will see a download for the slides for today's presentation. And you will also see a download for the information for the complete webinar series. So if you haven't registered for part five yet, which will be the last in our series, the link is there for you. Also, we have a question panel in that GoToWebinar box. And we would ask if you have questions during today's webinar that if you would please put them in there and I will periodically um, jump into Ray's presentation and read off questions that have come in so he can hopefully get you an answer. Um, and if we aren't able to get you an answer today, then we will work on getting an answer for you and following up. So with that, I think that's all the housekeeping items I had. Ray, are you ready to go? I'm ready to roll. Thanks, Ray. All right, so we ready? <laughs> okay. Well, good afternoon, everybody. As Victoria was saying, my name is Ray Brushhart, and I'm with the Ohio LTAP Center. And um, this is a part four of five of our Work Zone Traffic Control and Safety webinar series. And today we'll be talking about flagging on two lane roads and uh, also mobile operations. And um, let's see here. So, you know, previously we talked about uh, a lot of general things like uh, how this is based upon the Ohio Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And uh, we went over um, proper temporary traffic control devices like cones, drums, barricades, arrow panels. And uh, we talked about the differences between rural and urban roadways and the impact it has on our work zone designs. And uh, we went over, you know, how each typical application has a list of standards and uh, guidance and options uh, that help us to um, offer various levels of safety, like the, the standards are the shall condition, the minimum level of safety and devices and then we enhance that with our guidance and options we also talked about uh, roadway safety concerns and uh, we went over some roadway crash statistics and work zone crash statistics and um, we talked about the two-lane rural road being the most dangerous type of road in ohio and uh, because it's um, that's where two thirds of our roadway fatalities have occurred. And so, you know, we talk about flagging today. We'll be talking about working out on these two lane roads and uh, closing one lane of those two lanes. And so we want to make sure that that we don't make it even more dangerous than it already is. Right. So. Um, we want to make sure that we provide uh, ample advance warning to the motorists. Most of the time they're traveling at 55 miles per hour on these two lane rural roads or even 45 and above. But we, we already learned that 45 is high speed. So, you know, we have to accommodate high speed traffic on these two lane rural roads. They need uh, plenty of distance uh, before they arrive where the flagger is standing is to uh, make sure that they can slow down and be prepared to obey whatever the flagger is telling them to do. <clears throat> so 
So um, let me get to the right screen here. Let's go ahead and begin our lesson five. This is lesson five of, um, of my full day work zone traffic control and safety class where we talk about flagging. Usually I show a, a video on flagging to start things off, but I guess with this um, as a webinar, I could show you the video, but then you wouldn't hear it. But I was just going to show you where I would find such a, uh, a nice flagging video for everybody. So if you uh, remember, I've showed you the, um, the ODOT website in previous sessions and uh, how you can find the Ohio LTAP webpage within the ODOT website. So if we go to the um, LTAP webpage, see if you can see the ODOT up here in the top left corner. So this is part of the ODOT website. We are LTAP is in the Division of Planning and the Office of Local Programs. And um, so here's our LTAP homepage. And uh, right here on our homepage is a the icon for our YouTube channel. So we have uploaded hundreds of training videos uh, in many different categories onto our YouTube channel. So if you were to um, click on the YouTube icon, then it would uh, take you to our Ohio LTAP YouTube channel. And so, so this is it. This is the uh, our Ohio LTAP YouTube channel. So as you can see, we've got lots of different uh, videos, but the key here is to come over here to the playlists button. If you click on it, then it organizes all the videos into different categories. And so you can see, you know, we have a, we have a work zone category over here, which is really good. Um, updated six days ago is a work zone traffic control course, like what you're taking right now. But another thing you can do to find videos is you can go up here in the search box at the top. And uh, I don't know if I explained this before, but there's an LTAP office in all 50 states, including Puerto Rico. And we like to borrow from each other as much as possible. If, if one LTAP office has um, something new and wonderful, then we like to borrow that. So uh, what I have discovered is that the state of Virginia's LTAP office has the uh, latest and greatest flagging video. So what you would do is you could type in the word flagging into the search box and then the plus sign and then Virginia. And when you do that, you can hit the search and then these top two videos that pop up, VDOT flagger training. I, oh, I usually watch the second, usually show the second one uh, for the, my class here. So VDOT flagger training is a very good flagger training video. So I, I definitely recommend that. So just wanted to share that with you. So as we begin our flagger training, we have to realize that flaggers are critical to traffic safety. Consequences of improper flagging may be severe and flaggers have important responsibilities. And why is flagging such an important profession? It's because a lot of people depend on a flagger's clear guidance. Here we have a picture of the flagger standing on the shoulder of the roadway at the, be at the beginning of a cone taper which is the preferred flagger location. We don't want the flagger standing out into the lane of travel. So who depends on the flagger? Well, we're talking about the workers themselves, the motorists, pedestrians, all road users, bicyclists, big trucks, and of course the flagger him or herself. And uh, we need to flagger to follow standard and uniform flagging procedures. Remember the, our manual is called the Ohio Manual of Uniform 
traffic control devices. So the word uniform is very important. Also standard. You know, if if someone's driving down the road, I'm coming to you live today from Pickaway County, and if uh, if I was driving down one of the many two lane roads here in Pickaway County, and whether it be a state route or a a county road or a <clears throat> city of Circleville road, uh, I I would expect that flagging operation to look almost identical in all three locations. The only difference that might be is the effect of the speed limit. You know, the the 35 mile per hour speed limit within the city of Circleville would make it a little different than uh, than being out on a 55 mile per hour roadway, county or state route, or even township. But that would be the only difference is this, you know, the, the same signs would be out there and the flagger would be using the same stop slow paddle and they, the flagger would have his uh, standard um, high intensity uh, colors on the vest or whatever he's wearing that have to meet the standards for that and the standard motions that they would make for stopping traffic slowing and releasing so <clears throat> when we follow these standard and uniform flagging procedures, we're increasing motorist respect, we're promoting a uniform response from the motorists, and we're minimizing driver confusion. So what do flaggers need to do when they're out there? Well, one, they need to stay alert at all times, face oncoming traffic, be highly visible, and standing alone on the shoulder of the road out of the path of vehicles. So there in the picture on the right, you see the three standard signs that are in a flagging operation, followed by the flagger. Not just anybody can be a flagger. So we need to uh, select a person that has the ability to communicate instructions and maneuver quickly, the ability to control signaling devices, the ability to apply safe traffic control practices and the ability to recognize dangerous traffic situations and warn others. Here is a list of the flaggers equipment. We have the stop slow paddle, which is re retro reflectorized for nighttime use. There's two sizes, 18 by 18 and 24 by 24 inches, but if I was you, I wouldn't even think about getting the 18 by 18. Might as well get the 24 by 24, right? And then uh, it is attached to a rigid handle that is somewhere between five to seven feet high. Here's the uh, stop slow paddle. It has the, the white stop legend on a red background on one side and the black slow legend on the orange background on the other side and then this slide is asking about is it okay to use flags well the temporary traffic control manual says that the use of flags should be limited to emergency situations intersections and low speed and or low volume locations which can best be controlled by a single flagger and of course in emergency situations we want you to uh, switch over to use and stop slow paddle whenever those become available. Again, here's a <clears throat> preferred flagger location. So never in the path of moving vehicles on the shoulder at the beginning of the taper. Of course, this is a lane closure. You know, let's take a look at some pictures here. You, does this uh, person have the a clear escape route as he's sitting on his chair and blocked by his personal vehicle on the shoulder? I think not. So you should not be sitting down if you're the flagger and you should not have your personal vehicle parked right beside you. you know, that can be a uh, something that someone could crash into, which is not good for the motorist. You know, we talked about making our work zones as safe as possible for both the workers and the motorists. We learned that there's actually more motorists killed in work zones than workers. You know, and uh, when, it, when someone is traveling at uh, 
high speed and they crash into a fixed object, it doesn't turn out too good for the motorist. Take a look at another picture. Okay, here's a picture that uh, taken down in southern Ohio where we have uh, lots of curves and hills. And uh, if you look closely, you can see where the flagger is standing. A flagger is standing here behind a dump truck halfway through the work zone. And here he has the stop slow paddle jammed down into some old faded cone covered in tar. And uh, it's right up against the pickup truck. So basically he's making everybody stop. And then he by himself waves them around if he thinks they can make it around that curve. <laughs> so needless to say, this guy got some time off uh, with the way he set this work zone up. So there, he should the flagger should be well in advance the other direction um, of this work zone um, and have a buffer space included as well. And this should have been a, a two flagger operation. So currently in Ohio, we do not require flagger certification or registration, but if you would like to get proper uh, certification or registration, you can get those in, uh, from ATSA. That's what I did. I took a week-long course from ATSA, which stands for the American Traffic Safety Services Association. If you go to their website, you will see that they have uh, dates already scheduled to come to Ohio in different locations, and you can become a registered flagger and also things like registered uh, traffic safety supervisor or worksite supervisor, things like that. And also the Ohio Laborers Union offers training as well. How about this picture? We have see the flagger standing in the middle of the road talking to either a worker or a truck driver. And uh, that's definitely not the preferred flagger location here. Again, they should be well in advance of the work zone uh, on the shoulder of the roadway. Here's a couple of good pictures. We got uh, this guy sitting on his tailgate, reading a book with the stop slow paddle jammed down into a cone. So um, this guy obviously has not heard of uh, distracted driving or anything like that. So um, he's right in uh, harm's way, definitely, as he's sitting there on that tailgate, not paying attention. And then here we have a guy laying on the road. Um, instead of standing. That probably doesn't sit too well with his boss or all the other motorists driving by. Here we have someone turning their back to traffic as they're standing in the middle of the road, just assuming that they'll see them and their sign. And um, you know, we talked about this sign here on the right side. It says flagger ahead. We want you to update your flagger sign. It should be a symbol of the flagger uh, instead of the words flagger ahead. This guy is uh, sitting here in the shade. Might not even recognize him uh, as a flagger there. And he's using a <clears throat> he's using an orange flag. So that's not the proper color. If you're going to use a flag, it's red, and it's only for emergency situations. This looks like it's a uh, routine roadway maintenance here, so you should be using the stop slow paddle. Here was a video that I had to play. For some reason it stopped working, uh, but it's a person on a bicycle. The flagger is on a bicycle and they have the stop slow paddle pointed straight out, so you, it's not even so the word, the letters are up and down instead of across. And he was, uh, it's like they had some kind of a, a combination of flagging and um, a mobile operation. So 
So as you can see, there's people could just drive right up on here. So uh, some notes about the drivers that approach you when you're the flagger. We have to realize that they might be tired or preoccupied. I guess that's a fancy word for distracted. <clears throat> and uh, we need to get their attention so that we can guide them through the work zone safely and to protect our fellow workers. So, you know, that has to do with our advanced warning area, the signage, and, um, you know, we, we're going to learn today about some things that have come along, um, some other devices. Um, one of those is portable rumble strips. So, um, it may be that in certain situations we would want to put some portable rumble strips on the road beside some of our signs. So that would uh, get people to focus on the road if they are distracted because we know that our rumble strips that are on um, the edge of the road and on center lines, they do a good job of that. So these portable rumble strips might uh, be a good uh, device for us to accomplish that. And I'll show you where to find some specs for that right on the ODOT Office of Roadway Engineering's webpage. So controlling drivers is difficult. They want to make their own decisions. They like to be in control. They have their own expectations. Work zones are more prone to crashes and flaggers are some people think the flaggers are just in their way. You know, they're not, maybe they don't have much respect for flaggers. So it's not an easy job. Also, uh, the road itself might affect the driver's ability. Uh, we can all think of things that uh, in that realm from bad potholes to um, what else? Snow and ice, something like that. Of course, the drivers might be under the influence of alcohol or drugs, and maybe the age of the driver could uh, uh, make them uh, so that they're not ready to see you, or maybe they can't see you that well. Like maybe a youthful driver, maybe they didn't really have much training in, uh, when it comes to work driving through work zones or a flagging operation on a two-lane road, or maybe the, the older driver Maybe it's somebody that had their driver's license taken away um, and they can't really see very far, but they still get out there and drive to the store and back. Um, and of course the weather. So this, these are all reasons why we never, you should never assume that a driver sees you. If we uh, open up the temporary traffic control manual, the section, the chapter 6E, we can find out uh, a lot of information about flagger control. Uh, at the very beginning of 6E, it says uh, there's a chapter on the flagger. It says when operations are such that signs, signals, and barricades do not provide the necessary protection on or adjacent to a highway or street, flaggers or other appropriate traffic controls shall be provided. Signaling directions by flaggers shall conform to the OMUTCD. So if we actually opened up the manual, so let's do that. Got, um, here's the temporary traffic control manual. If we went up to section 6E, And uh, we can see that there's, um, this is where it's all about flaggers. <clears throat> so here's chapter 6E, flagger control. It's got the qualifications for flaggers. Section 6E.02 is where you would go to read all about the high visibility safety apparel. It's a standard. Let's see what this first sentence says. It says for daytime and nighttime activity, flaggers shall wear not should, it's a shall, where high visibility safety apparel that meets the performance class two or three requirements of the ANSI 
ISEA 107-2004 publication entitled American National Standard for High Visibility Apparel and Headwear and labeled and labeled as meeting the ANSI 107-2004 standard performance for class two or three risk exposure. So when you have the proper vest or other apparel on for flagging, it should say right on the tag of that garment that it meets the ANSI class two or three requirements. So this is the part of the uh, manual that goes into in depth on these situations. It even goes into automated flagger assistance devices. Those are coming becoming very common. I've noticed as I drive around or a stop slow automated flagger assistance devices. So sometimes you have a temporary traffic control signal, traffic signal, or sometimes you have a stop slow paddle that's automated. So that's one way to protect your flagger, right? Okay, so that's the section of the manual, 6E. Okay, so when we talk about flagging requirements, probably the easiest way for you to remember the flagging requirements are to remember the ABCs of flagging. So A means advanced warning, B stands for be visible and alert, and C for control, how to um, properly stop, slow, or release traffic. So these are essential aspects of any flagging operation. So let's uh, go through the ABCs here. A for advanced warning, and uh, you know we can we can check these out also anytime we want by looking at typical application number ten in the temporary traffic control manual. So uh, it says for advanced warning, we need to let the public know that we are out there working, and we need to have these signs installed before we start the flagging operation. One little note is when you are installing the signs, you you are a mobile operation at that point, so you should be abiding by typical application number 17 uh, with your high intensity uh, flashing strobes and lights on um, as you are doing that. So let's take a look at some examples of our typical advanced warning signs in our flagger operations. The first sign that the motorist is going to see is the road work ahead sign, or if you work for a utility crew, it would be utility work ahead sign. Followed by the second sign, which is one lane road ahead sign. You know, you might think, well, why isn't it a right lane closed ahead sign? Well, we don't want you to, it's not that situation. It's a two lane road, and it's uh, more effective if we say it's a one lane road ahead uh, on the sign. The third sign in the standard signing package is the flagger ahead symbol sign. So this is where we tell the motors what to do with that third sign, if you remember from our last session. So they need to be prepared to either stop or go slow. Now, if we look at the typical application number 10, it talks about a fourth sign under guidance and options. So in other words, as we've learned, this enhances the safety of our flagging operation by simply adding this sign to the sign series. And so as you can see here, it says use of the sign is optional. That means it's listed as an option in the typical applications note page. <clears throat> so it says on high speed roads, place this sign 1000 feet before the flagger station. So this is a sign, this is the, uh, this would be the third sign in the series. The next sign would be the flagger symbol, and then next would be the actual flagger. Ray, we have a question on the question pod. It says, do public agencies have independent consultants to visit randomly and verify if flagger slash MOT rules are used as per specs?
Did you hear me right? Well, it looks like we might have lost Ray. So let's give it a minute and see if we can get him back on here. I know from what we're seeing on the screen that it looks like he's trying to log back in. Um, hopefully he'll be able to reconnect here. And if not, he can always call in on his phone. So I'm gonna send you a message that way too. So hopefully he just got my message there letting him know to call in on his phone. This would be a good moment to take a stretch break. Stand up and take a stretch. And if you haven't downloaded the handouts yet, you could do so at this time as well. I'm gonna send him the number real quick. Okay. So while Ray is getting the number to give us um, a call and get the audio back rolling again, I also know that he would want to mention about our RON updates. And I don't know if um, very many of you have seen our RON updates before, but they're called RON because of the route of navigation R-O-N, and then um, we have those available on our website, and we do have RON updates that are focused specifically on work zone traffic control and on flagging. So um, when he gets back on here, once he's moved through the rest of the information, I'll ask him to please also show the RON updates for you. So we know from looking at his screen that he's working on getting himself called in. So that'll be a good thing. I'm sure he'll be back on here in just a minute. So, you know, I... I'm gonna send him another message. Something on my end that hopefully I'm seeing that might help him out. Ray, are you there? I'm trying. Can You're you back. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. I am? Yeah, and okay. you, have, you have quite a fan base here because it looks like pretty much everybody hung in there. So that's a good thing. Oh. I was Let telling him about- Let me headset again. Uh, well, that or just stick with what's working right now. I wouldn't mix it up. This is working. Let's just stick with it. So. I'm sure if you have a teeny bit of background noise, they won't mind. Because. All right. 
Okay, we're good. Can you hear we, hear me? You. we can. And I promised okay, him while we were waiting for you to get back on the audio that when you were all said and done, you would also show him the Ron updates location on our webpage. So right, right. Keep that in mind. I don't know, what happened there. I don't know either, but I do but, have a uh, question question for you that came into the question pot. I'm going to read it off. It says, do public agencies have independent consultants to visit randomly and verify if flagger slash MOT rules are used as per specs? Question about inspecting. If it's set up properly, that's that's what OSHA, I've been told OSHA and PERP, which is P-E-R-R-P, -R -R -P, it stands for Public Employees Risk Reduction Program. I know they've been out there randomly inspecting work zones because when they get, when when agencies get busted for not having it right, they, I get the call and they're required to go through this training. Um, what was the second question? That was the whole question. Oh, so you're saying well, OSHA, PERP, and then wouldn't also the worksite traffic supervisors be yeah, responsible for the setup as well? Those who take those tests through yeah. Emily Willis's section. Right. Hopefully they have somebody like that. I mean, ODOT would, but, you know, at, at the local level, on a lot of these two lane rural roads, especially townships, I mean, they're lucky to have enough people to even set up a proper flagging um operation i've been preaching to them to work with surrounding townships so they have enough people to get these their jobs done some of them have been doing that um if you if you talk to some of these rural townships they like to say gee whiz uh we've got enough people for if we use two flaggers then uh, we've got nobody left to do the work <laughs> so um you know hopefully they've uh, they've all been working with their neighboring townships to get enough employees. So, uh, but it is important for the, whatever agency is out there to have a foreman or somebody in charge of making sure that uh, the signs and the cones and all that stuff, the buffer space is all set up properly, um, especially with, you know, with the people, at least for the people that take this training, you know, they are aware that about the need to make these two lane rural roads safer and uh, not less safe while we're out there. Okay, so I, I was going to show typical application number 10 in the, um, if we take a look at this, let's see here. So there's TA 20. We want to find 10. All right, so here's 10. So here's the, you can zoom in and out. Here's the drawing of a flagging operation in the manual. But then I said, you know, it's important to read the note page that goes with this. So in the note page, let's zoom in on that so it doesn't hurt your eyes. You know, we have our, our standard and then we have guidance and options. Well, up here in the options, it says a be prepared to stop sign may be added to the sign series. And then if you go to the guidance down here, it says when used, the be prepared to stop sign should be located between the flag or sign and, and the one lane road sign. So that's where that information comes into play. So again, you, you not only look at the picture, but you got to read the page that goes with it as well. Okay, so that's the be prepared to stop sign. We also want to do our best to draw attention to our signs. You know, if we use the latest signs, the newest signs, if you meet the standards for those, they are going to stand out. They're very bright. Um, but, you know, here in this picture, you know, it just shows that just putting down one of your newer cones beside the sign draws attention to it. You know, you could also add flags we've seen. Uh, to the sign, or some even uh, add flashing uh, amber lights, but we want to try to draw attention to the sign. We got to get the spacing of the sign correct. 
in the advance warning area. So for high speed rural situations, we know those signs need to be 500 feet apart, but then with uh, lower speeds, um, you know, like, like 40 miles per hour, you know, 40 to 45 in an urban situation, they can be 350 feet apart. And then the picture here on the on the right is obviously showing a, a more must be an urban situation with 35 miles an hour because those signs are barely 100 feet apart, if that. We also want to make sure we don't put signs in places we don't want them to be, like in the middle of a sidewalk. You know that uh, that's not good for the pedestrians, is it? So. That's not good. Also, the, you also need to see the sign. So we got a this one over here is showing a the utility pole kind of blocking that sign. That must be for a more longer term project. Since so they're using post mounted instead of portable. So that's the advanced warning or the A part of the ABCs. And next we have our B visible and alert or the B part of the ABCs. That Here's where we talk about the need for the flagger to be visible and alert. Uh, so we want to make sure the public sees you and have the proper clothing and equipment. You know, if you have your sign set up properly, the motorists are basically going to be searching for the flagger. And it should be very easy for them to spot the flagger if he's wearing the proper safety apparel. And um, so as we see on this slide as part of the this uh first came out the need to meet these standards first came out as part of this uh, federal work zone rule that applies to everyone in the work zone even law enforcement officers if they are performing the duties of providing traffic control and that became effective back in 2008 so Here's some examples of uh, garments that meet those requirements. They meet the ANSI class two requirements. And then uh, some places have already upgraded. They don't even use class two anymore. They've, as far as um, during the day, they still want you to wear the class three vest. I know the state of Virginia does that for instance, but especially for nighttime, Class three during nighttime, usually it includes the trousers that goes with the, the vest. And then I know ODOT requires a hard hat when they're out there flagging. So, you know, it's up to the local governments to uh, have their own policy if they want to require that or not. Some garments look like they would probably meet the ANSI requirements, but they don't. So here's some examples of that. These, even though these look like they might be bright, they actually do not meet the class two requirements. The only way that you would know for sure is if it says so right on the tag. Remember I said it has to be labeled as such. And so here, right in this label, it says ANSI uh, class two, you have the two over here. So that's what meets the class two. So here's a picture of a flagger with the, the vest on. I don't know why there was a, he had his uh, stop slow paddle in a cone, but for some reason it got photoshopped out. I don't know what the story is to that. So Let's also talk about the taper that we install as part of a flagging operation. So on two lane, two way roads, we need to discourage drivers from moving into the open lane because head on collisions are possible. So we need a taper out there. And this taper is much shorter than a merging taper. Even at high speeds, the, the length of this taper is only 50 feet to 100 feet long maximum. And uh, this encourages drivers to slow down. That's because from a distance, it looks like a wall of cones across their lane. 
the, another difference between this and the merging taper is that the requirements are for the spacing of the cones is different. They're closer together in the taper than um, they're only 20 foot maximum in this sort of taper. And it's uh, the speed limit in feet between um, cones is the requirements for the merging taper. I'll show you that here in a minute. So here's a depiction of a the two-way traffic taper uh, in a on a two-lane road in a flagging operation. So as you can see, it's only 50 to 100 feet long. So then the final letter is C for the ABCs. It talks about control. So remember that a flagger is considered to be a legal traffic control device that must be obeyed. So we need the flagger must have these three basic flagging skills, stopping, releasing, and slowing traffic. So here's some uh, pictures from the manual. So it says when we stop traffic, we've got the, uh, the, st the word stop from the stop slope paddle pointed directly at the motorist with our right arm extended. And then our left hand is raised with the palm facing the motorist. Or if we're using a flag, our right um, arm is extended and the flag is uh, straight out, hanging down. Usually it's a weighted flag so that it, it, uh, it stays hanging down. To release traffic, we are then going straight up and down with our extended right arm, never above the shoulder, just to the shoulder height. And um, to slow traffic with the stop slow paddle, we're we have the word slow. You might even use your left hand going up, up and down slowly to get people to get them to um, slow down that way. So we're not waving the signs or the flag uh, in, in that um, instance. That would confuse the motors. So here's a picture of a flagger but uh, in the stop position. And then here's uh, one demonstrating the slow position is pointing over at the, the lane that's open for them to continue driving. Again, we're not waving the sign at drivers. So it says here, you want them to go slow. So if traffic is coming in too fast, It says it is not necessary to stop it, display slow, use your free arm to motion traffic to slow down. So we know this guy is not standing in the proper location, is he? Right out there in the middle of the road. Do not become a target. So the most there's different types of flagger operations. One of the, the most common is the two flagger operation. And so communication between flaggers is essential. Typically one of the flaggers is in charge. So here we see in this in the typical application drawing the position of the two flaggers. So we note that uh, it's made a special note that there are no arrow boards in a flagging operation that would uh, people would be focused the motors would be focused on the arrow board flashing and not the flagger so we don't use arrow boards. So here, we're, you can see the cone taper here. So the, it's showing that the flagger is standing at the beginning of the cone taper. And it also shows a buffer space in here. So the, the distance between the end of the taper and the actual workspace, that is the buffer space. One note about this drawing, it's showing that if this car is traveling in an eastbound direction, there's a curve here, and here's the workspace. So it's demonstrating that the workspace is just around that curve. So 
we don't want the flagger to be standing around that curve. So the flagger is standing here before the curve so that the approaching motorist can see the flagger standing there. So that's why they always have this flagging operation drawn with a curve just to drive home that point that the flagger needs to be in a visible uh, position on the shoulder of the road. So there's different ways to um, communicate between the flaggers. If it's a short distance on a straight road, maybe you can communicate by sight and have a signal like the raising of your your hat for letting the other flagger know that um, it's clear. Otherwise, uh, the preferred method is with the two-way radios. They have another way that uh, I've never seen it used here in Ohio, the flag carrying method, where you actually hand a motorist a flag and tell them to give it to the other flagger at the other end of the job. But um, I'm sure a lot of flags have disappeared with that operation. So the site method, both flaggers have visual contact at all times. Two-way radios are needed when flaggers cannot see each other. Or maybe you have multiple flaggers. You know, anytime you're flagging operation, if it's a lengthy operation, maybe you have some intersections in between or a lot of driveways, and maybe you have a you need to have more more than two flaggers. So it's another reason to have two-way radios. Of course, you want to make sure you bring have the radios charged and bring spare batteries. There's a flag here. And then we have the a situation here of the advanced flagger. And uh, the reason for the advanced flagger is to uh, sometimes they might have to stop each vehicle or advise them of the situation ahead or to give instructions um, just to. Uh, Maybe it's a situation where you've got some curves and hills and you just want to make sure that uh, the motorists, you're doing the best you can to provide ample advance warning uh, that there is a flagging situation ahead. Sometimes it's okay to just have one flagger to do the flagging but you have to meet some conditions for that to be okay. It needs to be a low volume road with good visibility in both directions, a short workspace. You know, this a lot of utility operations fall under this category. Maybe they're just working on one utility pole, for instance, and they're not gonna be there for that long, so short duration, and then uh, lower speed. So here's a, a depiction of a single flagger operation. We've got the one flagger standing here on the shoulder of the road directly across from the workspace and they have good visibility in each direction. And here's a picture of one showing that uh, it's a good idea to have two cones at your feet over here on the shoulder of the road. And uh, again, visible to traffic coming from both directions. And you're never stepping into traffic. Then here's a depiction of the multiple access points. This is the reason why you might have additional flaggers at cross streets or maybe some busy driveways. Flaggers direct traffic in the proper direction, making sure that no one pulls into a lane that might have traffic coming right at them. And then here's another special situation uh, when we have to deal with roadway railroad crossings at great intersections with railroads. We don't want to allow stop traffic um, to back up over the railroad crossing. So you need to have good communication between the flaggers to make sure that that does not happen. And here's where we talk about nighttime flagging. Procedures are generally the same with a few equipment changes. You want to have a flashlight with a glow cone or lantern. Your um, retro reflectorized garment would be upgraded to meet class three. 
and then your stop slope paddle needs to be retro reflectorized and then we prefer you to have actually you're supposed to have auxiliary lighting unless it's some emergency situation if it's not an emergency situation if we go back and look at the typical application in the note page we'll see that there's there's really only one standard written on this page in the bold letters it says at night flag or station shall be illuminated except in emergencies so that's why that says that and not with your truck headlights either it's special uh, auxiliary lighting shining down on the flagger then what do you do if you're flagging and emergency vehicles need to get through so if you're a flagger you want to allow that emergency vehicle right away as soon as feasible however you you want to make sure you stop that emergency vehicle if it's not safe for them to get through for some reason so as a flagger you should plan ahead and think about if if there is a situation that the crew is working on that day where you would actually have to stop an emergency vehicle from coming through so if you need to handle emergency situations again you know, we want want you to anticipate the unexpected be prepared to respond and of course protect yourself as well so types of emergencies would be drivers disobeying your command what do you do if someone neglects to stop for you you know one of the good ideas is to have a, a referee's whistle or an air horn to alert the workers that uh, there is a vehicle coming through and then uh, crashes or accidents that would be listed as an emergency so in these situations you need to Notify your supervisor, call for help, but uh, you're still going to need to continue to control traffic and stay in contact with other flaggers. Just to reiterate, stay on the shoulders and have an escape route. So there's somebody they're really not on the shoulder of the road and there's no buffer space there, is there? I think we need to talk about the buffer space so um, if we take a look at um, let's look at a different reference manual if we go to um, remember this our little green flip book if we uh, Turn to page 17 of this booklet. We can see the tables here. These tables, let's look at this bottom table here on page 17. It's this one right here. We zoom in on it. Over here on the far right side is the length of the buffer space. So you can see the differences here from 35 miles per hour. If you work at a, in a city or village, you go all the way across here and the buffer space is 250 feet. We compare that to 45 miles an hour, it's 360 feet. And at 55 miles an hour, it's 495 feet, might as well say 500 feet. So as you can see, that's some, some pretty big differences in the buffer space. And so by looking at uh, typical application number 10 here, you know, we're talking about, let's zoom in here. So the area between the end of the taper here at the center line into where the crew is working. This is the space, it's the buffer space. So it's always vacant and it's there for the errant motor, the errant motorist to have room to slow down, come to a stop before he 
crashes into anything or anybody. So it's a safety option. You know, in most, most uh, typical applications, it's listed as optional, but uh, I don't see it listed as optional here in a flagging operation. So let's look what the, if this drawing is any different from the from the temporary traffic control manual. You know, it's not it's not listed as as optional here. So it's very important that you include the buffer space, even if you can't get the full 500 feet. You know, you, you get what you you can, and um, I don't know. You know, sometimes there are reasons why you can't get that buffer space, but um, you know, if you can't get that distance, then you should make a note as to why you can't. But you should never have you should never you should never have people working in this area here. That gives the it gives you no room for error in high speed traffic. So the buffer space is uh is key to both the worker safety and the motorist safety. Ray, this might be a good time for your first poll question. Yeah, let's ask a couple of those. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and launch it. And this one did completely fit on there. So if you could please take a moment and vote, we'd like to get more than 80% of you voting. Just making sure everybody's awake out there. We had it all planned. Ray was going to drop off after the first half an hour, make sure everybody was awake. And then now <laughs> we're, we're doing poll questions after the second half an hour. Now the, the deal with Ray wasn't on purpose. We're glad we got you back, Ray, really. I'm glad to be back. Okay. It was quite well, we a harrowing experience to know that I dropped off into space somewhere and I, tr I was trying oh to get gosh. back. It was well, I'm so glad that for once you didn't remember to set do not disturb on your Skype chat because that helped us get you back here. Oh. So. All right, a few more people need to vote. We're up to like 60% now. We need 80% voting. That's what we shoot for. You don't have to know the answer. Just go with your gut. We're not recording who voted what. Oh, we're getting much closer. We're almost there, Ray, and then I'll share the results. All right. Well, okay, why don't you tell here me we what go. Was the, what was the question? Because I can't see the question. Oh, that would be good, wouldn't it? In the temporary yeah. traffic control manual, which typical application is titled lane closure on a two lane road using flaggers? All right, I'm going to close it and I'm sharing the results. Um, we have 20% that said number four, 53 that said number 10, 9% said number 11, 12% said number 17, and 5% said number 27. Well, I feel like I've let the class down. I guess I didn't say it as many times as I thought I did, but this picture shows you what I'm talking about. It says figure 6H10, uh, 6 refers to part six of the manual and then H is the section in the manual and then 10 is the typical application number. So 10 is the correct answer. All right, I'm gonna do your next poll question. This one I don't think completely fit on the screen so I'm gonna read it the end part of it off. I'll read the whole thing actually. The preferred flagger position is out of the path of moving vehicles. Typically this is on the shoulder of the road at the beginning of a cone taper in a visible location facing traffic. And then we want you to let us know true or false. All right guys, gotta vote. All right, they're voting. We're getting there. It's quite a few people voting because we have 193 people on the webinar today. So, okay, here we go, Ray. Okay. The results are 
we have 95% that said true and 5% that said false. Okay, well, it's true. It is true. So, what was that game show where, you know, where they polled the, the audience and people would just, if they didn't know, they went with the highest, uh, where the highest number of people voted for a certain answer? In that case, it works in this case. So, 95% were correct. Do you want to do one more poll question? Yes, let's do it. All right. Okay, I've launched it. It says, which of the following TTC devices below can actually enhance the safety of your flagging operation by being added to the advanced warning area? And then they've got their options there. Okay, we're, we're getting closer to 80. Keep voting, guys. All right, I'm going to close it up and share the results. We have 13% that said right lane closed ahead, 14% that said arrow panel, and 73% that said be prepared to stop sign. The 73% get it, it's be prepared to stop. It's listed as an option as I scroll the screen down. I, can you see the screen right now or not? Yes, I hit the results so we can see your screen. So here it says right here, the be prepared to stop sign as a guidance and also under option. So that's the answer. Sounds good. And then we have a question that came in through the chat pod. Are you ready for it? Hey, let's hear it. Absolutely. Example, Born ready. In the example with the high speed buffers, wouldn't it be more prudent to lower the speed limit or the, lower the speed? They didn't say limit. They just said lower the speed. OK, well, how would you do that? You know, this is we're talking about a, a two lane rural road and we're talking about roadway maintenance activities. And um, it's not like some project out on I-71 that's um, going to be there for a year and we have these permanent um, signage and uh, expensive lighted up panels that, that tell people to the speed limit, it shows them the temporary speed limit of 55 in a lot of cases on I-71. But you know, we just, you don't have that option on the, on these jobs that the crew is going to be out there for anywhere from an hour to six hours, you know. I, I would like to see if we come up with some ways to do that. Um, okay. I mean, there there are some plaques. I've seen how some attach some speed plaques to uh, the signs, um, but I'm not sure if that. Uh, well, I guess we could. Uh, we'll have to bring that up for discussion. But I'm. I would be. Of course, I would be all in favor of that. Well, they did put another. Um, option here in the, the question box. They said reduce speed ahead signs and orange speed limit signs, but I want to make sure we're able to get all the material covered. So let's go ahead and move forward. Would you like me to run the next poll question or do you want to go back to your presentation? Well, just some research on that. Uh, be prepared to stop sign. First of all, when ODOT is out there flagging on our two lane rural roads that are 55, our, our crews are supposed to always use that be prepared to stop sign. And uh, you know, the, the research behind that sign is it does make people slow down. All right, so what did you just say, Victoria? I said, do you want me to run the next poll question or did you want to go back to your presentation? 
I think that was the end of flagging. So if anybody has, let's run another poll question. If anybody has more questions for flagging, let's let, give them a chance to okay. uh, type in a question. Put the poll question up, but it didn't quite fit on the thought they okay. gave me in the software. So I'm gonna read it to everybody too. Section 6E.02 of the Temporary Traffic Control Manual is the section where you can find out about the specification of the flagger's high visibility safety apparel, which meets the requirements of ANSI, the American National Standards Institute. And then you've got your options there. Oh, they're voting fast and furious this time, so that's good. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll out so you can see the responses. Or not, you can, but they can. 89% okay. said true and 11% said false. It's true, I got it verbatim. I was gonna show, there's a lot of pages in this manual. <laughs> Where was I at? There's F. 6E2. Okay, here we go. So 6E.04. So there it is, 6E.02. What I did was I copied and pasted this first sentence. That's all I did there, people. All right. Do you want your last question? Better. It's up to you. Is it about flagging or mobile? Moving, mobile. Okay, I'll let's hang on to it. Then. All right. So, is there any questions? Any other questions in the box? Um, why don't we let you get through with what you need to finish up, and All then right. we can go back to them. All right. So, I wanted to also show the. Um, back to the ODOT website, if you go to engineering, the engineering divisions page, and then click on roadway engineering, you know, this is, uh, it's really loaded with uh, work set information, but also even flagging. So here's roadway engineering. And if you came over here to, uh, on the left, there's all sorts of things to click on, on this column uh, under uh, traffic control, we have maintenance of traffic. And so this is where we have that. You can get down here to, uh, let me see, maintenance of traffic, standard construction drawings. And then this is where we have some cool things here. We got examples of different flagging situations. We have um, see here flagger closing one lane of a two-lane highway for a stationary operation that's kind of like it should so this is the typical the drawing in typical application number 10 is it's, uh, it's not just a drawing anymore it's a standard construction drawing and um, if we zoom in on it we'll see that they want a maximum length of closure to be 2,000 feet so that's what it normally is, but then we have other options. If we go back, we'll see the next one down the page is, says flagger closing one lane of a two lane highway for paving operations, non-federal. So this could be county or township, I guess, but it says maximum length of closure, 5,000 feet. So you can close up to a mile this way. You know, a lot of a lot of township roads and counties do up to a mile closure as they do their chip and seal operations. So you know, there's there's a note page on the next page of that typical application. So it talks about um, all sorts of stuff. So again, if you don't just look at the picture, you got to look at the picture and read the notes. 
And then the third one was Flagger closing one lane of a two lane highway for paving operations, federal. So if a federal money is involved, must be a probably a two lane state route. Then if we zoom in on this one, you'll see maximum length of closure is 9,000 feet. So there's, uh, they've done some other stuff here as well. Yeah, usually when you go that far of an operation, you're not gonna, you're gonna go through some intersections. And so if you're gonna, if you're at an intersection, a four way intersection, see on this ODOT drawing, of course they don't show it as a four way. That's the other thing with uh, local governments. We have, you know, you're gonna run into intersections and um, with four ways. And so when that happens, you need to know about another typical application, which is number 27. So let's take a look at that. I can get this box out of the way here. It's kind of hard to do sometimes. Okay, so we come down here to where the typical applications are. We're going to take a look at typical application number 27. So this one shows us how to set up a flagging operation at a four-way intersection. Let me uh, zoom out. So shows you the signs. You know, they're showing here where, that there's a work area in the intersection, but it, not necessarily if you have a, like in that standard construction drawing, you're just paving through here. But um, this is where you would get the information on how to deal with the intersection. Again, there's a note page that goes with this as well. So that's what happens like if you're probably within, definitely within 1500 feet of a four-way intersection, your, your, your flagging operation is gonna interface with that intersection. So you're gonna to have to no typical application 10 and 27. They will fit you have to tie them together. Okay, so I better get moving on to mobile operations at this point. I'm gonna run out of time. So let's move on to moving and mobile operations. Uh, this is where we're talking about work that moves intermittently or continuously. The work area and the workers are in motion. And then uh, there are typical applications involved, as you may have guessed from the temporary traffic control manual. So here, if we uh, let's uh, see what is the difference between moving and mobile. Moving is a, it is mobile for practical purposes, but there's a fine distinction. A moving operation, a special case of mobile operations. Could that be more confusing? M mobile operations are where you're. You are you could stay in one location fewer than 15 minutes. It's usually during the day. Uh, here's some examples: manhole inspection, aerial cable replacement, overhead light repair, maybe even some, sometimes even pothole patching is set up in a way for mobile operation. If you're if you're just uh, walking behind your truck that has the cold patching and you're just filling in potholes with a shovel and walking along. Moving operations though, are, are they're similar, except the work is done during the movement and the stops are fewer. So this is where we're talking about pavement marking, striping or street sweeping, mowing, surveying or litter or trash pickup. So both of these operations require proper traffic control procedures. You run the risk, more of a risk of surprising motorists. So you need to figure out how can you, how can you become visible to the approaching traffic? It says uh, work vehicles usually move slower than regular traffic. So this makes you a target for trouble. So there's a typical application here for each one of these situations uh, that involve where are you inside the right-of-way? Are you off the shoulder? Are you on the shoulder? Are you
Are you in a lane of traffic on a two lane road or are you in a lane of traffic on a multiple lane road? Each one has their own typical application. And visibility is a key factor. That's why when we look at these typical applications, you need to read the note page for the standards, guidance, and options. So we need to, here's the fundamentals, visibility. So all devices and workers are visible. Advanced warning, so the public knows there's maintenance ahead and control, proper traffic control, so people know how to, um, well, what are they, what's expected of the motorists? Are they gonna stop and wait for guidance or can they uh, just change lanes and go around you? The first thing that's listed in the standards are about your vehicle. We need to make your vehicle vis visible to the traffic, either the work vehicle or the shadow vehicle. So we do that with our light lighting package on the trucks. Uh, flashing strobes, flashing lights, or high intensity flashing strobes and lights, and maybe even a light bar across the top or arrow panels. Also, retro reflective markings are on the back of all ODOT vehicles now. So, in a lot of local government work vehicles, have uh, retro reflective markings on the vehicles. Well, even my state minivan has uh, retro reflective markings on the back. And we need to are there ways to enhance the visibility? And so we looked at signage enhancements with flags and lights. Um, you know, just because just because you're in a mobile operation doesn't necessarily mean there's no signs. You know, there's you can always put signs out. I know a lot of utility workers they think all they all they have to do is flip their truck lights on, but in some cases you know, depending, especially on the time you're going to be out there, it may be that you should be putting signs out as well. So proper advanced warning signs and channelizing devices. Also, the location of your work space uh, affects visibility. Okay, so, you know, two-lane rural roads in Ohio, what are we famous for? Hills and curves, right? We never want to disappear around a curve or over a hill. You know, the job of the shadow vehicle, for instance, would be to stay visible to the motorist, or it may be that you should not be using a mobile operation in those locations. Maybe you should be using flagging operations because they provide more advanced warning. You have to keep in mind that motorists need enough time to make adjustments. You know, that's when you're looking at those buffer space requirements and sign spacing requirements and distances and feet, that's all about stopping sight distance for each speed. So this uh, shows different types of uh, streets that you might work on and um, the, the needs for more advanced warning or signage. So if we're, you know, if we, talk about low speed residential areas. We don't need some big elaborate setup and a lot of signs, you know, 25 mile per hour subdivisions during the day where everybody's at work. You just can just use your lights usually. Then our suburban streets, they, they, a lot of suburban streets are known for hills and curves. I know Dublin has a lot of curves on their uh, suburban arterial roads and some of their two-lane rural type of roads. Uh, we definitely need more advanced warning signs, even for short duration projects. And then high speed facilities, you know, even not just our two-lane rural roads, but also I-71, for instance. We, ODOT even sometimes has mobile operations on our interstates. So sometimes the, especially the multiple lane road mobile operations right in a typical application, they show that you need a shadow vehicle with an aero panel. So if we start off with looking at typical applications, you know, the, the first one is really the mowing. Um, the, the typical application numero uno, number one, is, uh, is all about our mowing off the shoulder. So if we take a look at Number one, 
you know, we're, we're the, the work location is off the shoulder. So maybe all we need is a road work ahead sign. But as we know in Ohio, um, and we're, if we're mowing along the roads, it's kind of rare that local governments can mow by being all the way off the shoulder like this. So this doesn't apply all that often, except if you're on a state route. But then next is typical application number four. So that's when we're working on the shoulder and we're not in the through lane. So here we have signs that say road work ahead and shoulder work. We have some options here, truck mounted attenuator and arrow panel set to caution mode with the four corners. Then the next one would be on the shoulder with minor encroachment, where we, we actually are sticking out into the lane a couple feet, but not enough to block the lane. So we're actually using a, a shoulder taper, a buffer space, truck mounted attenuator, and the cones, definitely need the cones out here, maybe even drums if we're, if, if we had a 12 foot lane, a drum might actually fit and still um, be wide enough not to close that lane. Ray, you've got about three minutes left. <laughs> okay. So then the next one would be typical application number 17, which is where well, you're in the lane of traffic. And so that's one that I uh, really want everybody to know about. So number 17 is definitely one of those cases where you look at the picture, which is here, you're, they're in the lane of traffic. You must have a sign on the back of the shadow vehicle. The four corner arrow panel is optional. But then you really have to come up here into the note page and read the standards. This is where they list shadow and work vehicles shall display high intensity rotating flashing oscillating or strobe lights and if an arrow board is used it shall be used in a caution mode and then it talks about um, additional shadow vehicles might be used to warn and reduce the speed of oncoming or opposing vehicular traffic law enforcement vehicles may be used for this purpose and uh, um, and then the final one is there's also a RON update on our LTAP page devoted to typical application number 17. So that's a, I would suggest everybody read that because we go over and, above, over and above this typical application to show you even more things to consider when you're working on a mobile operation on a two lane road. And then the final one would be multiple lane roads which is typical application number 35. So this is what you'd see, for instance, if you're on I-71, where ODOT is closing down either the left or the right lane. You can see in this case, we've got arrow panels on the shoulder and in the lane. So these both these vehicles have arrow panels. So it creates like a Chevron effect to get people over. And so, you don't see signs necessarily on the side of the road before this, but that doesn't mean you can't put signs down uh, for road work ahead. And if you're close in this lane, you can put a sign that says left lane closed ahead. But then, you know, these are the large arrow panels that can be seen for over a half mile away because they're high intensity. So, and then there's, of course, the note page that goes with it here. So those are all the, the different typical applications that involve mobile operations. So uh, again, the key is visibility. I went through those. So it says to use common sense, which you know you got to think of, always put yourself into the driver's seat of the motoring public and ask yourself if you were driving down the street at the speed limit, would I know that? My crew is out here working and know what to do. So 
you know, you want to answer that question honestly to yourself. And um, so you definitely want to talk about this. Can't stress it enough to have a good tailgate talk before you leave the garage and exactly how you're handling that mobile operation. And if there's a lot of concern for advanced warning, then maybe you should switch to flagging instead. Thank you, Ray. All right. We appreciate your time today on this webinar, and we are right on 2.30, so I don't want to run anything over. We did have um, a number of questions that came in right at the end into the question pod, so we'll have Ray follow up with a question and answer document um, that we'll send out via email here within the next week. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to see you on the last one of these webinars next Wednesday. and. Have a good rest of your day and stay safe. Everyone take care. Thanks, everybody.